Hey folks, I want to give some example quotient groups. So our first example will have our larger group G be Z mod 12Z. So the numbers from zero up to 11 under mod addition mod 12. And our subgroup is gonna be this uh, cyclic subgroup generated by the element four. So I start with four, I add four to itself to get eight. I add four again to get 12, but 12 is just zero in Z mod 12Z. So the element four generates this cyclic subgroup, zero, four, and eight. So the elements of G mod H are going to be the cosets, the left cosets of this subgroup H. So you always just have H or the identity combined with H. So its elements, as we already saw, were zero, four, and eight. But then you have the coset one plus H where you add one to each of these elements to get one, five, and nine. You have the coset two plus H, you add two to each of these elements to get two, six, and 10. You have the coset three plus H, you add three to each of these elements to get three, <laughs> you had three to each of these elements to get three, seven, and 11. You might ask, why don't I have the coset four plus H? Well, the reason being is if I, if I try to figure out what the coset four plus H is, I add four to each of these elements and I get four, eight, and then eight plus four is 12, which is zero in Z mod 12. But that's just the same as zero, four, eight, right? You know, sets don't pay attention to order. So this is just the coset zero plus H that we've already seen. So four plus H is the same as the coset zero plus H. And these are the same as the coset eight plus H. Okay, so these aren't different cosets. They're just cosets that we've already seen. You know, let, let's, let's do that again with uh, five plus H. Okay, if I look at the coset five plus H, I add five to each of these elements to get zero plus five is five, four plus five is nine, eight plus five is 13, but mod 12, that's one. I could just reorder this to get one, five and nine. And I've already seen that coset. That's a coset one plus H. Okay, so, um, these cosets might have multiple names, but they're still the same coset. So in summary, um, you know, this group G has 12 elements. The subgroup H has three elements. The number of cosets I'm gonna have is always 12 divided by three or four. Here are my four cosets. And these cosets might have multiple names. We saw how the coset zero plus H is the same as the coset four plus H. And we saw how the coset one plus H is the same as the coset five plus H, et cetera. Okay. So let's look at the Cayley table for this quotient group. The elements of the quotient group are the cosets, okay? So I put those cosets on, on the rows and the columns in this Cayley table or multiplication table. And now let's start filling it in. Why don't we figure out this element first? So let's look at what we get when we take the coset three plus H and we add it to the coset two plus H. So we look at the coset three plus H, we add it to the coset um, um, two plus H. If you remember our group, our, our rules for combining elements in, in quotient groups, you just combine these two representatives, okay? So in Z mod 12 Z, three plus two is equal to five. And this plus H just comes along for the ride, okay? But what I'm not gonna write here is five plus H. And the reason is five plus H has a better name. You know, 
let's let's not call it five plus h. Let's call it one plus h, right? So what I really put here is is it's the same as the coset five plus h, but let's use the name one plus h. All right. So you know that's that's using the rule here where um, a plus h that coset plus the coset B plus H is equal to the coset A plus B plus H. Okay. Before you might have seen this in multiplicative notation, which looked like AH combined with BH is equal to ABH. But now we're doing additive notation instead of multiplicative notation. Okay. So let's fill out this table. Zero plus H combined with zero plus H. I just add zero and zero and I get zero plus H. Where are my other zeros? Well, two plus H combined with two plus H is four plus H, but another name for four plus H is just zero plus H. And similarly, when I combine three plus H and one plus H, I get four plus H, but another name for four plus H is just zero plus H. All right, where, where are my one plus H's? Well, you know, one plus H combined with zero plus H is just one plus H. And then look at two plus H combined with three plus H, you know, that's, five plus H, but we saw five plus H is one plus H. Where are my two plus H's? Well, two plus H combined with zero plus H is two plus H. One plus H combined with one plus H is two plus H. But then I also have down here, three plus H combined with three plus H is six plus H, but six plus H is the same as two plus H. And my three plus H's can be obtained either by uh, three plus H combined with zero plus H or by two plus H combined with one plus H. Okay. So what this tells us is that in Z mod 12Z, you have this, well, okay, what, what, what is this group isomorphic to? This quotient group G mod H, what is it isomorphic to? This is isomorphic to Z mod 4Z. You know, you'll see these diagonal stripes here. If I just remove all the plus H's, this is just the Cayley table for Z mod 4Z. And in a sense that I'll make more precise in the next example, what this tells us about the larger group is inside this larger group, Z mod 12Z, hidden in there, we have some structure that looks like Z mod 4Z. So the symmetries of Z mod 4Z are inherent or present inside this larger group, Z mod 12Z. That's, that's one thing that this quotient group is telling you. And we'll see that a little bit more uh, clearly in the, in the next example we do. All right, let's plow ahead with one more example. Let's look at the group of symmetries of a square. So allow me to find a square here. D4 is the group of symmetries of this red square. So I have four rotations rotate by zero or by 90 or by 180 or by 270. And then I also have flips. So I could flip in the horizontal direction, the vertical direction across one diagonal D or across the other diagonal D prime. So those are my group elements. Okay. This group is not abelian. So not every subgroup is necessarily normal. But let's look at this subgroup K, which contains just the rotation by zero degrees or the rotation by 180 degrees. It turns out K is a normal subgroup. So I can look at the quotient group D4 mod K. Its elements are the cosets of K, okay? So first I have the identity combined with K or R0 combined with K. 
that just gives me the subgroup K back. I could multiply by uh, the rotation by 90 degrees, all right? And then I get the rotation by 90 degrees and the rotation by 270 degrees. That's another coset. I could combine these elements with the horizontal flip and I get the horizontal flip and the vertical flip. And my last coset is obtained by combining these elements with the diagonal flip. And I get one diagonal flip along with the second. So those are my cosets of the normal subgroup. So they're the elements of the quotient group. So the Cayley table for this quotient group has those elements in its rows and columns. Okay. And you can multiply out to find uh, how you fill in this Cayley table as we did before. So for example, you know, if you wanted to um, find this entry here, well, I want to combine HK with HK. That's just H combined with H, and then I bring the subgroup K along for the ride. But H combined with H is just the identity, okay, which we've just written this as SK. So that's just a brief explanation of, of where this entry K is coming from. <laughs> okay, but what is this quotient group telling us? Well, D4 is a larger group. D4 has size eight, right? It has eight elements. It's a little bit harder to work with. This is a smaller group, just of size four. The structure of this, this quotient group is Z2 cross Z2, right? I have those diagonal crisscrosses. Okay, and what, what this is telling us is that Z2 cross Z2 in some sense lives inside this larger group D4. We can see Z2 cross Z2 inside this Cayley table for the much larger group D4. So what I've drawn here is the Cayley table for D4, but I've, I've ordered the elements differently than you might expect. You know, you might put zero degrees, then 90 degrees, then 180 degrees, then 270 degrees. I've ordered it zero and then 180, and then rotation by 90. And the reason is I'm keeping the cosets together. So these two elements belong to this coset K. These two elements belong to this coset R90K, and etc. These horizontal and vertical flips are in this coset and the two diagonal flips are in this coset. So now when I draw out the Cayley table for D4, here it is, but you'll see the structure of Z2 cross Z2 inside here, okay? So these two by two blocks, you know, correspond to these various cosets, right? So hidden inside this larger Cayley table, for D8, for D4, right, you can see the structure of Z2 cross Z2 living inside there, which is quite nice. And, and that, that really hints to the importance of quotient groups. When you have a complicated group like, like D4, okay, it's, it has this eight by eight Cayley table. It might be hard to see the structure. But here in this quotient group, the quotient group just has size four, it's a simpler structure. But the properties you know, of this smaller quotient group are living inside the larger group. All right, so thanks so much. That's just two examples of quotient groups and a little bit of an intuition of what quotient groups tell you about the, the larger group from which they were uh, produced. Thanks so much. <laughs>